Welcome back to Tap Into TV. I'm Brian Brodeur coming to you from East Main Media Studios in Little Falls, New Jersey. On this week's show, we meet composer and sound designer Louis Gentile. Clinical psychologist Dr. Meryl Dorff joins us again to discuss the reasons people choose to mask or not to mask. Suburban real estate expert Lou Panaccio tells us about his life and career. But first, we visit the Saratoga Automobile Museum to learn about their exhibits and their upcoming annual auction. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dustin Lanterman, the communications director at the Saratoga Automobile Museum. Dustin, thanks for joining me. Thank you, sir. You've got a fabulous facility up there. You've got all kinds of things going on. Let's start at the high level. Tell me about the museum. So the museum uh, originally was an idea that had come about in probably the late 90s um, by Carol Cook. He was really kind of the person who had the original idea to bring an auto museum to Saratoga Springs. They chose the Saratoga Spa State Park. Of course, there were a couple of buildings that were uh, deactivated at the time, uh, one being the bottling plant, the other being the Roosevelt II bathhouse. Uh, so they chose the bottling plant because of its size. It's, uh, it's you know, availability close to the Avenue of the Pines. Uh, it's proximity to Route 50. Um, just really because of, you know, it had, the, it had great uh, architecture, lines, space. Um, so it really was kind of the best option for them to have a museum. The renovation started in 2001 and were finished uh, early 2002. And then the museum opened to the public on June 1st of 2002. Wow. Someone arrives at the museum. Tell me, generally speaking, what they're going to find there. Tell me a little bit about the collection, and then we'll follow up and talk a little bit about your special events. Absolutely. So when people arrive at the museum, I think they're first greeted by the architecture. Mm -hmm. The building stands out. It's, you know, it's the classic revival architecture of the building with the big palladium windows. Uh, it's very welcoming. It's very beautiful. People like love to take pictures of it, um, myself included. Uh, and then when you come into the building, you kind of have a sense of the openness of the museum. It's very airy. Um, so then you then you go from there and you start seeing the cars. Downstairs is always changing. It's always usually about six months. Um, so right now we're in the middle, the beginning part to the middle of the Dyson collection, uh, which is Rob Dyson's, a lot of his race car collection and private collection out of Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, so we have a, a Porsche 962, we have a, a, quite a few uh, McLaren Indy cars that are, are owned by him. A couple that came from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We have uh, a, a couple of his personal uh, Ford Model A's, one of which he owned in high school and still drives today. Wow. Uh, he actually picks people up at the airport in that car. Um, <laughs> so he still has a love of Model A's. I think he has somewhere around 13 to 14 of them. So this is just the tip of the iceberg wow. uh, for Model A's and Rob Dyson. But we have a lot of early Indy cars, uh, you know, 1913 Isetta Francini, which was one of the first cars to really race, uh, a foreign car to race uh, Indianapolis back in the 1900s. And, and then out right up to, you know, a modern LMP car, uh, the Lola's, the MG Lola, and of course the Lola that we have that they donated to the museum in 2017. So on the second floor, we have two static exhibits that were part of our charter. One of them is East of Detroit which focuses on cars built and produced in New York State from the very early years up until most recently. Uh, and then we also have Racing in New York, which covers pretty much every single aspect of racing in New York State uh, with a heavy emphasis on Watkins Glen. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's importance in NASCAR and the Grand Prix uh, starting in after, the, after World War II. Uh, we, I mean, we really have a little bit of everything that people would love to see. I mean, there's just, there's, you know, including the 1928, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the 1928 Franklin Airman sedan that was owned by Charles Lindbergh himself. Uh, it was given to him by the Franklin Motor Car Company uh, as a way kind of for them to, to really kind of cash in on his transatlantic flight. Um, so he went to Syracuse, picked up the car, he courted his wife in the car, he uh, transported dignitaries in the car. And one of our, our, our going sayings amongst the staff is if that car could talk, imagine the stories it would tell. <laughs> And of course, we have uh, a 1931 Piercero, which is, you know, the height of New York State luxury, as I like to say. Um, Piercero was a, was a very large automotive company that was eventually bought out by Studebaker in the early 30s, uh, kind of around the time that the Great Depression was beginning. Uh, so just to think that we had these giant luxury land yachts 
uh, that were built in New York State at the time is, is really quite something to see. Now, I want to focus on an upcoming event you have, which is a, a very high-profile auction. Yes. And you are showcasing currently some of the cars that will be in that auction. Let's, let's talk about some of those. Uh, number one, something that caught my eye at my recent visit there was the, the evil Christine car from the movie <laughs> Christine. Tell me yeah. about that. So this is the uh, one of actual uh, 16 actual cars that was used in production of the movie. Wow. From what I've, we've read and what's been documented so far is that this car was used for close-ups in the movie. So there were cars that were crashed. There were cars that were crushed and burned and, and relatively destroyed. This one was one of the cars that they used for close-ups, and, and it was driven by the director himself to and from the set. Uh, so John Carpenter actually drove this car, and, and it's absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. It wow. received a slight restoration a couple of years ago. It runs and sounds beautiful. Is the uh, You mentioned the Pierce Arrow. Is that also on the auction block? It is. We felt that it was time after you know almost 19 years of it being in the museum, it was time for its next chapter. Um, we, you know, it's all it's well loved by the staff and volunteers and, and the visitors to the museum. Um, but we figured it's time for its next chapter. It's time for it to be back out on the road. Um, it needs to be enjoyed in the sunlight. So we're hoping and we're we're fairly certain that a you know an avid Pierce Arrow or luxury American car collector will will own this and and really take care of it and uh, kind of lead it into its next chapter of her life. I mean, we just. We absolutely love the car and, and we're, we're happy to see it kind of go on to that next, that next phase. Dustin Lanterman of the Saratoga Automobile Museum. Dustin, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, sir. We greatly appreciate it. What is Tap Into TV? Tap Into TV is the flagship video channel within the Tap Into Hyperlocal News Network. Not only are we producing original video programming, but we're also developing branded content for industries including business and finance, health and wellness, arts and entertainment, and more. The Tap Into Network reaches a dedicated audience of over 8 million subscribers and users, with over 30 million unique page views last year alone. Nearly two-thirds of the Tap Into audience views Tap Into content five to seven times per week, and almost half of that audience bought a product or service because they saw it advertised on Tap Into. Tap Into TV content is automatically distributed to over 40 affiliate websites within the Tap Into network. And not only have we recently launched a dedicated Roku channel, but we produce a weekly half hour broadcast television show on News 12 Plus, which reaches over three and a half million homes across the tri-state area. We know how to tell your story, and not only can we professionally produce it, but we can effectively broadcast it as well. For more information about how Tap Into TV can help you, visit tapintotv.net or email us at tapintotv at gmail.com. To watch more Tap Into TV videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tap Into TV. I'm joined today by Louis Gentile, multi-instrumentalist, composer for TV and film. Louis, thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to speak with you. Uh, you have a really interesting background, done a lot of great work, and uh, let's start out. Would you tell my audience a little bit how you got your start in music, and tell me about what instruments you play and compose with? I started playing the guitar when I was about 17, 17, 18 years old, and then from there, I. Uh, just studied quite a bit. I was lucky. I uh, I got to do a lot of work, a lot of playing work. I was a full time player for a very long time, so I was doing that quite a bit. I, I was out in Nashville for a while. Oh, yeah. uh, I double uh, on pedal steel. I do a lot with pedal steel, and that's and that's uh, that's been really good too. And um, that's basically it. What happened was, I guess, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, there was an uh, ad uh, that I saw that they were looking for a music library stuff and it was a relatively new field back then and um, I submitted some uh, material that I had and uh, they used it and the, the ball just got rolling after that. Now this is an interesting detail I want to touch on because there are composers that have the luxury of scoring to picture 
but then there are also composers that create compositions that are then selected for projects. Tell me how it's different composing straight for picture versus composing for a music library. That's a really good question. Uh, first of all, I, I, I liked uh, writing right to picture because uh, I look at the picture and it just tells me, kind of tells me something, I get an impression from it. So that that's definitely helpful. With music library stuff, they generally uh, give you, they, they tell you what they want. Like for instance, they'll say that the cue has to be uh, a minute and a half long at so many beats per minute or something like that. And then they start to categorize it. Like I think I think of uh, Harpo, like this, like this. They'll have like hip inspirational and uh, they'll say a couple of these, all these different categories of music that they can just readily put in and edit real quick. So they basically, I would say to answer your question is that the big difference is that you're basically uh, running something that's gonna be able just to place that and they usually tell you exactly what they want where as with writing the picture usually writing working with the film maker and then they're telling you what you know they'll say oh i think the music should be there and it should go in and out and it, it could be something real short it could be something you know long all that kind of stuff so Give me a, a short selection of some projects that are on air or some companies you've worked with that people might recognize. Well, uh, let me see here. I've done, uh, I've, per I've contributed music for Harpo, CBS, I did, uh, was it The Amazing Race, mm -hmm. some stuff with Biography, Amazon, Video On Demand, some of that stuff. I did that, I did something for Hulu. Now, speaking of recognizable projects, uh, The Uncle Floyd Show. Tell me what you did for The Uncle Floyd Show. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, well, yeah, uh, that, was a while, that was a while ago when Uncle Floyd was on um, New Jersey Network. I was in a band called uh, Star's End, and we got a chance to be on the show, on his show, and then I did something with it. Uh, he came at a store that I was working at, uh, and uh, he was there, and uh, that was the second time that we did that. Yeah, that was a, that was a while ago, yeah. What advice would you have for young musicians or composers coming into the business? Because it's changed so much. What advice might you have for, for people who are aspiring to compose for picture? Well, one of the big things is to really have a grip on technology, audio recording technology. That's a big thing with it. I, I've been uh, lucky with that. Uh, I've been using technology for a really long time and it's just, you know, just kind of digitized everything now. So, but that's a big thing with it. And then also learn as much as you can learn uh, I'm very big on the traditional route, you know, like if uh, I, I, you know, I want to sound like, uh, you know, John Williams or something like that, you know, it's just something about this going the tr traditional route. And then I would say also finding a niche that you feel very, very comfortable with. That's one of the things with music libraries, you can really niche that kind of thing and then just build off of that. that that's an excellent point. I want to come back around to your guitar playing uh, because so many times composers work is influenced by the instruments that they play. Now, guitar is one thing, but you also have that pedal steel experience, which is an incredible instrument, uh, very emotive, very versatile. How do you think being a guitar player and a pedal steel player influences your composition? I like to quote um, Segovia when he said that the guitar is a miniature orchestra. So I, I think that uh, it, it works out really well with that. With the steel, the steel has this real singing quality to it. it has and like it has like this harp effect to it, mm -hmm. and that works very very well. And it's very accommodating for uh, sound design now too. Like you know, use like an ebo and just process it, so you can get some really interesting sounds from the steel. But I'm very traditional, Ralph Mooney, you know, type of traditional with it also. You know, we're big fans here of Daniel Lenoir, who in recent years has, has done a lot of pedal steel work, but processed, you know, not really traditional, whether it's distorted or affected. 
and uh, yeah, and it's a yeah. really interesting instrument. That that's I'd I'd love to hear more of that from you and and other players as well. Where do you uh, where do you think all this is going? The you know work for composers and and frankly the media business. You know uh, we have over the top. You mentioned Hulu. You know where do you think everything's going here as we're coming out of our pandemic era? One thing that I've learned that if it's if the, if the composition and the music, the quality of production is good, it just kind of cuts through. Like it just seems like if it's if it's well done, it, it just seems like everything could just fit. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be placed in a music library or if, it's, if a person's like a solo artist or something like that, um, uh, or you know, like in a film or anything like that. But I, I think that it's just it, you know, it, technology again is really big, sampling and all that kind of thing, like using sample like or sample orchestral libraries and you know implementing like players and things like that it's, it's, it's going to be that kind of hybrid i think uh, quite a bit sure where can people find out more information about you and maybe hear some of your music you can go on uh my website uh lewisgentile.net uh so it's uh, l-o-u-i-s-g-e-n-t-i-l-e.net lewis thanks so much for taking time to talk to me today oh thank you so much i really appreciate it As our communities begin to reopen, it's important for businesses of all sizes to let their customers know how they're moving forward, and we're here to help. The Tap Into Network is the nation's fastest growing hyper-local news provider, and Tap Into TV provides unmatched video marketing capabilities. Tap Into TV utilizes multiple platforms, including broadcast television, social media, our brand new Roku channel, and don't forget the incredible online search rankings that our content delivers. When you're ready, we're ready. Call or email us today. We'd be happy to help. It's time to get back to business. To watch more Tap Into TV, follow us on social media at Tap Into TV. I'm thrilled to be joined once again by clinical psychologist, Dr. Meryl Dorff. Meryl, welcome to the studio again. Here you oh, are. Thank you, it, it's great to be back. So I wanted to follow up with you on a topic that comes from a previous conversation we had. You and I discussed during the pandemic months uh, via Zoom about social distancing and some of the problems that people had with it, why people didn't practice social distancing. So I wanna take that to another step. I want to ask you your uh, input and your analysis about why people don't wear masks, why they don't want to wear masks when it seemingly uh, is in the public good. Let me uh, hear your thoughts on that, please. The first thing I want to say is that this dilemma is really not a new one. Uh, I think maybe the most obvious issue is that there's a political bias. Hmm. But let's get into some of the other issues. It was happening during the flu pandemic of 1918. The very, very same issues uh, arose then. Hmm. Uh, they had the same approach to managing the virus then because uh, there was no medicine for it. Uh, they had to social distance, they had to sequester, and they had to wear masks. And at that time, there was also a political difference uh, between the two camps. One camp uh, felt that it was uh, the, uh, the duty of every American to do what they could to stem the tide of the pandemic. Uh, and they abided by rules and mandates to wear masks. And the other group was very focused on their civil liberties to the extent that there was actually an anti-mask league of San Francisco. Wow. And they would protest maybe much in the same way that we're doing now. And uh, they were uh, very much at odds. So what's interesting is, you know, 100 years ago, we had these factions or these beliefs, mask, no mask, under a similar circumstances hundreds if not thousands of people dying, a public health crisis. Can you tell me a little bit about what motivation people may have to align with these camps? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's so interesting, we're so polarized. But you know, it makes sense to me if you think about 
that we are really in a global trauma right now. It is so stressful that people are trying to manage the high anxiety of just getting through these times. And one of the ways that I think human beings uh, respond to times of such uncertainty is that we gravitate to groups, to each other. We want to belong. Uh, and we want to be able to trust that there are people we can turn to who will be there and have our back. So I think those groups are created out of that. And that um, in order to remain part of a group that we feel we want to belong to, we actually take on the ideas and uh, uh, information that supports being in that group. And I think there's a concept called groupthink. Groupthink is a concept that was developed by this guy Irving Janis back in the 70s. And I think it, uh, it speaks to how groups are uh, formed during times of uncertainty uh, with people who are vulnerable to uh, a feeling and a need to belong. Is it fair to say that the stress and the disruption of the pandemic reinforces our need to belong to groups? Absolutely. It reinforces or, or creates these factions. Um, I think there's even uh, an element of self-censorship uh, hmm. where uh, if we're part of one group and we dare to have some doubts or some thoughts about something we don't agree with, maybe we'll tend to suppress those ideas, either to ourselves or not speak them, in order to remain part of the group. Because that's comforting to us. It's very comforting. It's a basic human need, I think, for attachment and belonging. And uh, particularly in times of stress and uncertainty, uh, those, those needs are just paramount. Well, again, Meryl, great advice, great insight. I can't thank you enough for coming in and speaking with me today. It's always my pleasure. Tap Into is a network of more than 80 franchise local news sites with more than 10 million readers. Bring local news to your community while owning your own business. Tap Into provides you with the training, support, and technology to help you build a profitable business. To find out more, visit www.starttap.com. Net. So it is my distinct pleasure to be joined today by Lou Panaccio, a broker and salesperson at Keller Williams Metropolitan in Morristown, New Jersey. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. So we have lots to talk about, um, both business and otherwise. Yes. So let's start with the easy stuff. Okay. Tell me about Linda Ronstadt. You have <laughs> seen her 56 times in concert. Yes. Tell me how you became a fan. It's all my sister's fault who took me for my 12th birthday to her concert in New Jersey, in Passaic, New Jersey. And we would, she was joking with me because I had Charlie's Angels posters up and she said, they're all gonna come down after you see Linda Ronstadt. And she was right. And I was just amazed at her voice. I was 12 years old. I couldn't believe what I was hearing and went to see her the rest of my life until she was you know, not able to sing anymore due to Parkinson's over 56 times. And I saw every genre of music that she performed. And to that point, she has crossed over a lot of genres over the years, starting in sort of a country rock mode and, and really covered tons of things. Well, thank you for that quick departure uh, into the music realm. So let's talk about what you do in the world. You're a broker and a salesperson at the Keller Williams Metropolitan Office in Morristown, New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. So look, easy question. What's going on in the real estate market? It's, it's dead, isn't it? Nobody's buying anything. Right? Not true. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what's going on out there. It is the busiest market, at least for me, and I know for so many others right now. You know, with the recent events, we've had uh, a lot of people in March, April, May, even June still keep their houses off the market and also people reluctant to go out and see homes. So uh, there's a huge shortage of inventory. There already was before this started because we've had such a successful 
10, 12 year run of increasing prices, low interest rates, and other things. So there was already a, a shortage of inventory to begin with. And then you add in the pandemic and everything that happened with that, and it made it even more critical to find homes for people. You and I talked offline before the interview about, you know, people that do business with you, it's about trust. Can you tell me about during our pandemic that we're in right now, how that's an even bigger factor for you and how you do business? Yes. Everything takes twice as long to prepare, whether you're doing an open house for a client or showing someone a property. And every client is different. So some will require that you wear booties. Some will require that you wear masks, gloves, one or all of those ab above. Um, so I have two huge bags that I bring with me filled with hand sanitizer, uh, masks, booties, wipes, disinfectant, so that whatever the client wants, either the one I'm taking to see the house to feel safe and comfortable and trust, or the one I'm doing the open house for and I'm letting people in. It's hard enough to buy a house, right? It's one of the biggest events in most people's lives. So you have that stress any given time, even in good times, and then you add in all of this and it makes it that much more stressful for, for everyone. So I just try to make everyone feel as comfortable as possible and even if I never use anything in those bags, they know that they're there and I'm <clears throat> doing everything to make them feel safe and comfortable. What is technology's role today, right. especially during a pandemic? How does that affect your doing business? I know a lot of realtors were afraid of technology. When I just missed when I came in, but prior to me just coming into the business, there were books on the table and that's how they did business. And you had to look in the book to find the listing. Hmm. And then just switched over to the internet, the Garden State, the MLS systems yeah, right. that we use. And I think people feared that you would lose your, your value, your um, standing as a realtor, and even your job as a realtor because of technology. And I see it as an enhancement because, especially now, I did my first virtual tour of a listing. I had a, such a beautiful listing right in the height of the pandemic, and I thought, oh no, no one's gonna come see it. But I met the videographer there, he filmed me. And you felt that went well and you got good feedback on that? It was a huge internet hit. Wow. The one thing I always tell people is that you can't replace the, um, the knowledge that the realtor has about the business itself and how to get things done. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen technology do that yet. Fair enough. I mean, you still need the expert. I think so, yeah. I don't think that the person will ever go away. So Lou, speaking of business, tell me what networking and business development means to you. You're part of the ABA networking group. Tell me about that. It's helped me grow professionally and personally. Um, you know, I was never a huge executive in my corporate career. I'm not, uh, and now I'm a real estate agent, which is fine. But I was sitting at a table of very highly accomplished people in ABA, and I was like, wow, these are people to look up to and to learn from. So I probably was a little intimidated in the beginning. And then um, as I realized that they were all there to help each other grow and be successful and, and uh, help each other, I was like, I, I, I got more comfortable and feel uh, assured that I have a lot to offer too. Right. Thanks for joining me today and uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thank you for having me. To learn more about Tap Into TV, visit tapintotv.net. Tune in next week for another episode of Tap Into TV. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can watch any of our video segments anytime at tapintotv.net. Thanks for watching and please stay safe and healthy.
Thanks for watching and stay safe and healthy. I knew I couldn't get through it all.